Well, welcome everybody. I'm so glad to see you. I'm so glad to see you. There are some of you, there are some of you right now going, man, I think he thinks today's Easter. All right, now listen, listen, I'm, gonna, I'm showing you that every single week as the beginning video before we walk up and open God's Word because the resurrection is the most important event that ever occurred in human history, and it's not meant to be a day. It's meant to be every day. So we're going to be reminded every day of the power of the resurrection. I love starting a new series. Let me just say, I loved the series, I Love My Church. That was great for so many of us to get traction on why we do this and what's our part and what, why am I here? What's God using my one and only dash? You remember this? What's my dash for? And you know what? I love that series, but I love doing something new. It's almost like, I don't know, like you're getting a new tool in the toolbox, like we're understanding something that God has for us that affects our lives. I love beginning a brand new series, especially about the most important single truth that ever existed, that Jesus Christ not only predicted his death, but he also predicted that he'd come back, and he did. And that changes the game on absolutely everything, and this series is going to have gold in it, because who doesn't want hope? Right. 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 Who doesn't want hope? We're going to talk about how that works. This is better than gold. I encourage you to take notes. Uh, you got paper in front of you, you're welcome to rip it off and use it. Uh, use the cards there. Maybe you take notes on your phone. Maybe you're going to hear a verse and you want to get a tattoo of that. Go get it. I'm just telling you, don't miss with God. By the way, somebody stopped me at the door and said, that verse you used in the middle, I'll tell you which one. He goes, right here. I'm getting it right here. I'm like, dude, make it happen. Rock on. You don't want to forget the truth that God gives, so I'm glad you're here. Hey, listen, I'm not apologizing that it's full. First of all, it's full because God is moving. Isn't that great? So secondly, it's full because some of y'all didn't change your clock. So listen, I'm just glad. To, and the people that walk in 30 minutes from now, let's welcome them with a round of applause. I'm just kidding. But we, listen, we're a place of grace. But welcome, welcome, welcome. I love you being here, and I love what's going down. Can I just say this? Um, I'm new, so this is like just new guy talk. Here we go. Uh, I'm here six months. Jack and I've been here six months like three days ago. Six months. And we love being here. And, and, and. And, and here's this thought. I'd love to encourage you to be here for this entire series, especially Easter. Uh, Pastor Pete, real quick, uh, we love Easter, but that is spring break. I know. I told you, new guy stuff. Here's what I'm saying. I want to just encourage you to pray about it. I want to encourage you to pray about leaving one day later. One day. And here's why. You don't want to miss what God is going to do on the most attended, most spiritually alert day of the entire year. And there are some people that will only be here if you let them know that there's a seat for them with you. Do you think you'll miss spring break that one more day if somebody you love comes to Christ? If somebody you love gets free, if somebody that you love finds themselves rescued by the grace and the power and the freedom of God, you'll be thrilled for all your life that you went one day later to Florida, but you helped your friend find a place to belong in the heart and the body and the, and the bride of Christ, okay? One day late, we could all go together, a big, a big like caravan, a convoy. We will go to Florida like at, right after this service. We'll go, okay? We'll hand you pizza on the way out the door. Go, go, go. Just be here that week, okay? All right, I'm moving on. Brand new series, and I want to start it with a true story about a really cool friend I've got. Um, I, got, I met this guy in seminary. I was doing my grad work. I had just come to Kentucky from New York. It was our first time ever in Kentucky. We weren't married yet, so I guess I was there without you at that point, right? So I come down, and I meet Rick. Now, Rick is a guy who's like a character in my life story. You're going to hear about a lot because I learned a lot from Rick because he was as weird as could be. And I love Rick. I love Rick, but he's a six foot five guy from Texas, and he's got this thick Dallas, Texas accent, which of course is what Jesus' accent is because he's a Cowboys fan. So my boy Rick, my boy Rick, I just, I know this is in the Bible. Uh, my, my boy Rick is just a unique guy, and I'm learning from him all the time. He's like five years older than me, and I'm like just watching his walk with God and learning and growing. I'm, I'm, in my, I'm like 21 years old. Rick, my friend from Dallas, loved Belinda. He loved this girl. Now, he, well, they weren't married. He loved her, though. Like, they had dated way back, and now they weren't dating, but, man, he loved Belinda. 
My boy Rick knew that God gave him Melinda, Belinda as a wife. This was to be his wife forever. He loved her. He thought she was a, she would go to work and he was at school with me, but he'd drive to her house and he'd mow her lawn. She'd come home, the lawn would be done. He'd do things on, he'd give her gifts. He would, he would send her fun things in the mail. He just was, he just loved, he just loved Belinda. The only problem is Belinda hated him. Oh, okay, listen, <laughs> Belinda, Belinda hated him. Okay, okay, she, 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 I know you're not supposed to hate, but she did. And, and she, she hated Rick, and, and Rick refused to believe it. I'd be like, Rick, man, I don't, you know, you're older than me. You, you know more stuff, and you know, I don't quite get this, though, because I don't think, I don't think this is how it's supposed to work. He's like, what? I'm going, you're basically a stalker. That's what you are. You're, you're a stalker, and that's just not how this works. He goes, I have, I have no doubt this is from God. And I'm going, Bro, weirder things have happened in the name of God. Are you sure? And he had this unshakable confidence, like this absolute confident hope. I will be married to Belinda. And I'm like, bro, you better hope you're right, because if not, you're going to get a restraining order. Guarantee. <laughs> Guarantee it. Oh, is she sick of him. He just had this unshakable hope. Now, when you start to talk about hope, the truth of the matter is, the hopes we have for ourselves and for the people in our lives, they don't always go the way we'd hope, right? They don't go the way we'd like. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. And the Bible doesn't promise you'll not find anywhere in Scripture. If you really hope hard enough for stuff, you get it whenever you want it because that's how it works. You know, the boy you want, the girl you want, the job you want, the money you want, the house you want, the body type you want. It's all going to happen if you just hope hard enough. Not in the Bible, not the way it works. But the Scripture does say... Isaiah 49, Romans 5, lots of different places. If you will put your hope in me, listen, you'll never be disappointed. How crazy is that? If you'll put your hope in me, says the Lord, you will not be disappointed. I find that to be remarkable. Now my boy Rick, he knew that Belinda was from God. And he would not quit. He just knew it was from God. And I am psyched to tell you that after 35 years of marriage, Rick and Belinda are happily married. And my boy was right. My boy was right. And you, and you want to know what they do? For 30 years, they've led a marriage ministry in Texas that serves hundreds and hundreds of couples. You want to know what the first week is on? Stalking. All right, I'm just telling you. That may or may not be true. All right, so I'm just, I'm just telling you. There are lots of things in life that get overrated. Lots of things. Movies get overrated. You ever gone to see a movie somebody said was the best? And you're like, oh my word, I slept through the whole thing. You ever gone to eat somewhere that you're like, I'm never going back, but somebody told you, you got to go there. Cars get overrated. Fads get overrated. Ideas are overrated. Lots of things in life are overrated. Hope is not one of those things. Hope is not one of those things. When you're trapped in a tunnel of hurt, pain, it is hope that lights the way out. When you're battling a lingering illness and disease, it's hope that gets you through. When you lose your job or you lose a dream, it's hope that cheers on a fresh start and a new beginning. When we say goodbye to people we love, it's hope that walks us through the grief when you're tempted to throw in the towel. It's hope that keeps you from doing it. It's hope that pulls you back from the edge. Lots of things in life are overrated. And hope, hope isn't one of them. Hope isn't one of them. Solomon, one of the wisest men, if not the wisest person to have ever lived, this is David's, King David's son, he wrote a good portion of the Old Testament. We don't think of it like that, but Solomon wrote lots and lots and lots of the Bible. And, and one of those books that I know some of you are studying because kind of New Year rhythms, people do that, the book of Proverbs, Solomon wrote, wrote most of the Proverbs. And Solomon, the wisest man to have ever lived, talked a lot about the power of hope. He also talked about the power of hope of hopelessness. And there's this really, I don't know, sad, true verse. Just like one of those verses that reflects back all of our experience. He said this in Proverbs 13, hope deferred makes the heart 
sick. Hope that is put off long enough causes heart sick pain. Uh, another translation translates those verses and says, when hope is crushed, the heart is crushed. Painful stuff about the power of hope or the power of the lack of hope. Now the dictionary defines hopelessness as when you encounter the intersection where whatever the thing of focus is becomes in your heart and your mind incapable of redemption and there is no solution to be found. And it is at this intersection where we get into trouble. It's at the intersection where we come, where something goes from a difficult or a sad or a disappointing thing to an impossible thing that we get ourselves in the most trouble. When we become convinced in our minds that whatever the thing is, is this bad and is never going to get any better, we begin to take a painful and unhelpful path. It's here where it's unfixable and permanent in our minds that we begin to magnify the negative. We, be, we begin to take what's low and we magnify it, and all that's good we minimize. You magnify that which is discouraging. You embrace self-pity. You become a victim. Because this thing or that thing or everything is just so bad and nobody has it as bad as I do. And you are reinforcing feelings of hopelessness and they become so powerful that they become synonymous with the tapes that play in your mind. You no longer need to experience the facts of what's discouraging because the tapes play all the time. This is bad and it's never getting any better. And there are some of you right now hearing me and you're thinking, yeah, there are things like that in my life. Man, I pray that those begin to come loose after today. I think this series that we can see that happen. There's this story that I recall from years ago. I remember reading in a book uh, a story by a man named Major Harold Kushner. And Kushner was a POW in a Viet Cong uh, prisoner of war camp for a half decade. Imagine being in a prisoner of war camp for a half a decade while he was there. And he tells the story of a young American Marine. He said this Marine was in his early 20s. He came into POW camp full of energy and more positive than he probably should have been for the situation we were in. And he said, this guy came in and people were kind of, kind of, kind of, I don't know, gleaning from his optimism. And this guy came in and he had a plan. He had a plan. He says he went and he made a deal with the commander, the Viet Cong commander. He said, listen, I will do whatever you want me to do. Count on me being a model prisoner of war. I'll do what I need to do. And the, and the, and the, and the, and the commander of the camp looked back at him and said, you do that and I'll release you. And this guy was like, what are you talking about? And he became the most optimistic guy there. He was following all the rules. He was the first in line. He had a smile. Kushner reports that he even became the leader of the thought reform group at the prisoner of war camp because he was excited to be let go. He was getting out of there. Kushner writes that in time, it became clear that the commander had lied to the Marine. He had no intentions of letting him go. That wasn't going to happen. And Kushner writes about that uh, in something I'd like to read you that's really quite, uh, I don't know, maybe the best way to describe it is uh, chilling. Okay, I think chilling might be the right word. Listen to this. He said these words. Kushner writes, When the full realization that he'd been lied to finally took hold in my young colleague, the Marine. He became sort of emotionless. The color began to leave his face. After a week, he'd become a zombie, refusing to work, refusing to move, refusing to eat. We would try to encourage him. He refused that as well. He simply laid on his cot, emotionless, By the third day of laying on his cot, he was sucking his thumb and he was in the fetal position with his knees pulled up to his chest. And in a matter of two weeks, he was gone. If the cause of death could be summarized in one word, Kushner writes, he says, it would be hopelessness. Hopelessness. Therapists and theologians agree. We can live as people without a lot of things. We can live without family and fun, without fame, without 
fortune. We can live without respect. We can live without love. We can live without comfort. But there's one ingredient in the human recipe of life that we can't live very long without. And that ingredient is hope. It is hope. Real, lasting hope. Hopelessness is the primary reason why marriages fail. It's the primary reason why people drop out, families fall out, depression wins out. Stats show right now that we are in a specific hope shortage. Statistics on every count, on every ledger, that we're in a place where hope is at all-time lows across the board, across the ages, and most specifically for those under 30. We are in a hope shortage. And that's why the series, that's why the resurrection, that's why who we have in Christ matters so very much. Hope is Jesus' specialty. Hope is Jesus' specialty. He says, and if you'll put your hope in me, you will never be disappointed. He doesn't say we don't experience disappointment. And we'll get to that in a minute in this series. But he says, you will never have to live under the weight of a hopelessness that disappoints you to your core. And here's why. Real simple, right from the jump. Here we go. Jesus never in Scripture offers us hope. He never, does, he never just offers hope. Here, would you like hope? He, would you, do you need hope today? Let me hand you some hope. Can I just dole out? Here, I'm, I'm giving out hope. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus, Jesus doesn't just offer hope. The Scriptures say that Jesus actually is our hope. That Christ himself is our hope. In fact, you may know Matthew 12, 21, and it's a beautiful verse. Uh, the verse that's in most of our Bibles uh, says this, and his name will be the hope of all the world. I like this one better out of the message paraphrase. It says this. It says, the mere sound, the mere sound of his name signals hope, even among far off unbelievers, even among people who are racked in hopelessness. The name of Christ is the signal flare that hope is present. Hope is available. Hope is on the way. I want you to get this. It covers all four weeks of this series. I want you to take a picture of this next slide or write it down because this is nothing the world will tell you, but it's what the scripture tells us. Hope is not a feeling. Hope is a person, and his name is Jesus. Hope is not a feeling. Hope is a person, and his name is Jesus. If you get that single lesson down, you have spared your heart, and you have spared your body and soul so much needless suffering. My hope is in Christ, and in Christ alone. I want you to get this. I guess I'm... I don't think this is selfish, but I've kind of been going around on it. As your pastor, this concerns me. Like for you, as someone who cares and prays for you, someone who's coming to love you. You're going to face the dark. Like one day unexpectedly, you're going to wake up in the dark. And you wouldn't have seen it coming. And you didn't choose it. And you wouldn't pick it. But there you are in the dark. What do I need to know? I can't see the hand in front of my face right now. I'm not okay. Things aren't okay. What? Oh yeah, what I need to know. Hope isn't how I feel right now. Hope is a person and his name is Jesus. If you get that straight, it begins to carve a way out. Now listen, I'm going to give you a hard kind of a whiplash for a moment, but it'll have a point, I promise. Um, I just want to confess, right, uh, tell you something here. It's kind of, okay, I'm just going to tell you. Uh, when I do social media, sometimes it's for like good stuff and God stuff and come to church stuff and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes it's just because I feel like laughing mindlessly, okay? And it's like, I just want to see mind-numbing stupidity. And that's, when, and that's when you go to people's reels and real videos, right? The two kinds of videos that I find myself laughing the hardest at, very impressive, you're going to be very impressed with this. Uh, first of all, 
The first kind, I guess I'll just put in the category, I call them hurt videos. When someone gets hurt, I find myself laughing all the time. I don't mean seriously hurt. I just mean fun hurt, F- fun for me. Uh, and like, like when a dad is teaching his kid how to bat and he comes back and the dad gets cracked, I'm like, that's high quality humor right there. That is high quality H2O. I love when that just happens. Or, or like I was watching the other day uh, when this dude was reading his phone and I don't know why, but he was on like these security cameras in this building and he's walking out in the courtyard, full suit, and he's reading his phone, and he's so engrossed, he doesn't see that he's walking up, and he trips over the edge, and he falls into the deep end of a pool, fully dressed in his suit, middle of the workday. I'm laughing real hard, okay? I'm so, or what about, you, you certainly have seen this one. All right, I'll stop, but I, this is so funny. It's on my, have you seen the one where the girl is running because she's leaving the store, and she just heads out of the mall, and she heads out the open door, but it turns out it's just really clean glass, and boom, and she bangs into it, and I'm like, Oh, that's good stuff. And like, but it gets better. You know why? She goes, oh, I'm so stupid. Goes to the side and runs out. Boom. And she hits another piece of glass. Come on. If that's not funny, I'm not so sure you've got a sense. That's good stuff. I love where people get hurt videos. They just make me laugh. All right. Number one. The second kind of video I like, I like these a lot. Uh, I, I like scare videos. I just do. I like videos where like somebody's coming around the corner at work. And like, like they've got 30 little clips in a row where 30 days straight they just come around and they scare the person in their office and they like throw their phone or they throw their pencil or they throw their coffee. Just bah, 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 just constant screaming. I laugh and laugh and laugh. Now listen, when you put all that together, I was thinking, so what's the point of all this, right? Yeah, is there a point? Here's the point. When I, I'll give you a warning. If you're ever going to watch a video and you see somebody at home and they're talking on the phone, they're like, yeah, listen, I'm going to get in shape this year going to be the best ever. You just watch. And they're like, here's what I look like now. You won't believe me in six months. And then they turn the camera and it's a dead giveaway. They show a picture of a chin-up bar. You know something good's coming, right? So they show you the chin-up bar, right? And they get up there and you look at the chin-up bar. And if you're like me and you're not a real handy guy, you still don't miss what's going on. You realize that they put a couple anchors in there. They've anchored it to the wall. You're like, Studs are farther apart than that. They've just got this thing in the drywall. This is going to be good. And, then, and, every, and invariably, every one of these videos, the dude steps off the chair, he jumps up and he grabs this thing and literally just brings the whole wall down with the whole chin-up bar on top of it. The, you know, the video's still rolling. He's like, Ugh. and I'm like, that's worth laughing at. I saw one the other day where the dude brought an entire door frame, landed on him, because all he had were these two little anchors in the wall, and boom, this entire door frame lands on him. Does nobody else find this funny? All right, fair enough. I need counseling. I'm confessing. I told you. It was confession. No judgment. Confession. And I told you it had a point. And this is for you note takers. Your hope, your hope is only as good as what you anchor it to. You hearing me? Your hope is only as good as solid, as trustworthy, as sturdy as what you anchor it to. There are so many counterfeits out there, so many hope thieves saying, hey, put your hope in me. And it's misplaced hope. These are imposters that can never deliver what they promise. Like right now, have you ever put your hope in your job? Yeah, you ever put your hope in your health? You, you, you ever put your hope in your relationship? You ever put your hope in your retirement fund? You ever put your hope in, fill in the blank. When you put your hope in circumstantial things, you are exposing yourself to a level of unnecessary pain that can be avoided. Now, it's not that things in life can't bring us joy or sadness, but are you anchoring your well-being, your actual heart's hope to that thing? You don't want to do it. The Bible says at some point, David's writing, why are we so discouraged? Because we place our hopes in things that can't bear the weight of our hope. They're not meant to bear that weight. So when you read the book of Psalms, middle of your Bible, you're reading David's journal. You get that, right? Like you're reading David's journaling. Here's the good stuff. Here's the bad stuff. Most Psalms start with, and then get, they get better because he starts thinking like we think. That goes bad. He then starts thinking like God redirects him and meets him in the writing and it becomes beautiful. Well, there's this spot in the Psalms that I was reading just the other day. I'm like, that'd be perfect to read to y'all. David is looking back at his life. He's older now, wiser. And he's looking at the hard things that have gone on. Things like the losing of a son. Things like King Saul trying to kill him, attempted murder routinely, hiding, his own people turning on him. He thinks at some point of what he calls the sins of my youth. 
he's remembering the disappointments in his life. And he's not sure which way to turn. He is struggling to find hope. And he goes as far as to say, God, I've given you my life. I put my trust in you. So God, here's what I want you to do. Here's how I'm going to stay happy. Let my enemies not speak disgracefully to me. Let my enemies not gloat over the mistakes I've made in life. And you're like, really, David? Your big plan here is that God is going to make your, you're going to pin your hopes to your enemies' responses to you? Well, I give you that background because you keep reading. And David turns as usual. His heart gets soft before God. He stops giving God demands. And here's what he says. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. And all day long, I will put my hope in you. You see, part of the reason we find ourselves struggling to find hope that lasts sometimes is because we put our hope in things that can't sustain it, and we tend to think of hope kind of like, oh, I don't know, kind of like a a passive thing. We think of hope as a feeling I have. Hey, I hope today goes well. I hope this job turns out. I hope I get asked out. I hope I get a scholarship. I hope I get a raise. I hope my mom's nice to me today. I hope my husband just has it worked out in the yard and leaves me alone. We got these hopes going on, and we kind of pin our happiness to these hopes, wishing for a good result. Hope in the Bible not the same word. Hope in the scripture isn't passive. Hope in the scripture is active. Hope is in scripture is something that is strong. It's a choice. It's a determination. It's not just optimism that something will go well. It is deeper. It is richer. And it is stronger than that. Biblical hope refers to actively, get this, actively choosing to anchor yourself to him, to anchor your hope to Christ. That is your choice. That is your decision. You can find yourself in the gutters and in pain and in sorrow, not just because something happened, but because your legs are swept and your hope is gone and you're at the bottom. Why? Because you anchored yourself to something other than Christ. I want to talk to you about what it means to anchor your hope to Christ so that that doesn't actually happen. And what I want to do right now is give you two of the best passages in the whole of Scripture, at least two of my very favorite. And this could be a tattoo, but they're a little long for that. But still, the reference is a good idea. Hebrews chapter 6. This is an important picture of what biblical hope looks like. All four weeks of our series on this. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Can we pause there for a second? Did you get that? I just want to make sure no one missed it. God gives his his oath, he gives his promise, and these things are unchangeable because God doesn't change his mind. God can't lie. God doesn't say, here's how I feel today, and let me feel some way different tomorrow. Now I've got to, I feel a different sort of way about some stuff, right? God never lies. He never changes his mind. So it says, okay, so God has given those things and therefore, therefore, therefore on his strength, we who have fled to him for refuge, we who have run to God, we can find great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. Describe that hope for us. Will you, author? Yeah, I will. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for your soul. Not just what you face now, but what you will face then. The trust that we have in the, in the anchor of God's hope is that, that there is a place where we have this strong and trustworthy anchor that the circumstances of life don't blow around. And you can't just hear this like it's an old poem. You've got to hear this like it's actual for your life's decision making. Am I placing my hope in circumstantial things or am I anchoring myself to a strong and trustworthy anchor for my soul that never changes, that never lies, that never moves. Man, does this matter because the hard stuff is coming. Life on this side of heaven never gets easy and predictable. It is always challenging. So how are we just not constantly like a cloud blown around? Today's a good day. Today's a bad day. This was hard. This was not hard. I liked last year. It was nice. This year stinks. Oh, COVID year is the worst ever. How do we not get thrown? There is a strong and trustworthy anchor. What does an anchor do? It keeps you from ending up on the rocks. 
It keeps you from capsizing. It keeps you from drifting into places you should not go. I don't have time for this today, but think of the number of places we go because something bad happens. We get sad of spirit, so we do things we never would have done otherwise. And sometimes we pay dearly. How do we get there? I didn't have an anchor. I was anchored to flimsy things that could not bear the weight of my life. So Hebrew says, listen, if you'll anchor yourself to me, you can have a strong and trustworthy anchor for your whole life and soul, this life and the life to come, life and life. Now having said that, I just want to point this out before I end. I have a word for some of you because somebody needs to hear this and I don't know where you're at, so you just need to know who you are. What I've just described in this kind of an anchor for your world, God wants you to have it. All right, if you're tempted to say no, duh, hold that in. Because a lot of the times we don't think that God wants the best for us. We don't realize that what he wants for us is that we've got an anchor that holds. That we've got an anchor that keeps us. So when things come our way that we don't see coming, we're okay. I'm not saying it doesn't hurt, but we're not on the rocks. We're not drifting into dangerous waters. We're not capsizing. How is it that your life's okay when the worst happens? Do you have an anchor that is strong and trustworthy for your soul. Do you want to know how I know God wants you to have it? All through scripture, he says that. In fact, one of the best people in scripture ever, Paul writes this prayer for you and for me. Paul says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Not in circumstances, but in him. Because then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Do y'all know that verse? Overflowing with confident hope. Have you ever thought of that before about your life? Did this just say I can overflow with confident hope where what happens at work doesn't, doesn't determine who I am when I go home? That when the bad text, the bad news, the bad report comes... I can be okay? How is that possible? I can overflow with confident hope if I will put my hope in the one who is the anchor for my soul. If you run to him, if you'll trust him, you will have indestructible hope. And let me just say as I wrap, here's why this matters as an introductory talk to the series. I don't know where you are. I don't know where you are today. Uh, I don't know where your hope meter is. Like, how about your love life? Where, where, where's your, I'm, I'm, I'm way, man, we've never, I'm, we're doing okay, I'm struggling. Or I'm alone and I'm not dealing with my singleness. Or I'm married and I'm not dealing with my married life. Where are you on the hope meter with your family, with your kids? With your finances? With your dreams and your sense of identity? Where is the hope meter of your life? I'm not asking a quantitative question like, like, hey, how's your finances? You got a lot of money put away? I'm not talking shallow stuff. I'm saying, how's your hope meter as it comes to realizing that stuff's flimsy? How, where's your meter today? And, and here's why I ask, and I kind of said this earlier. I don't really know how you're doing. Do you? On the inside, deep down. I don't know how it's going at home, how it's going at work. I don't know about your secrets, the hidden places where you're blocking and doing your thing, not knowing that that's a symptom of not being okay. I don't know how you're doing, but I know this. None of us knows what comes from the, around the next bend. We have no idea. The good and the bad will be a surprise to all of us, but here's what I do know. I do know that if you're anchored to your circumstances today, you are exposing yourself to much unnecessary pain because in a hope shortage, which is what we're in, in the world these days, there's a condition that happens that you need to know about. There's a condition that happens and it's called spiritual amnesia. Spiritual amnesia is simply this. We forget about the good things of God. We forget what God did in our past. We forget the ways he rescued us, the way he blessed us, the way he cared for us. 
And we also forget about how his promises going forward are things like, I have good plans for you. I love you and you're mine. I will go with you into your perils. I will walk with you in the valley. I will walk you through the storm. I will be with you to the end of the age. I am your shepherd and you're my sheep. You know my voice, so follow me. We forget the good promises. We forget all. We have spiritual amnesia and we find ourselves wandering. And here's why that's a problem. There is a distinct relationship all through Scripture, a distinct relationship between recalling God's work in your life and having hope for the challenges ahead. There's a distinct connection with being able to remember what he's done in the past to have faith and trust and hope for what he's doing in the future. My boy Rick, remember the stalker? My boy Rick, my boy Rick, he had this unshakable faith because he had dated Belinda in the past and she said it was over in the past and he knew it wasn't over just because she said it was over because in his prayers, God said it's not done till I say it's done. So he never stopped pursuing her because God gave him an unstoppable, unquenchable, unshakable, indestructible hope that could have landed him in jail but instead it got him a wife. Okay? Listen, I'm just telling you, when you know it's God, things change. There is a relationship between what you remember God doing And the faith for what you believe he will do, it's all through the Old Testament. It's the most often repeated Old Testament command from God in the Old Testament. He simply says this. When they're facing a new challenge, you know what he says? Who knows? Remember what I did when I brought you out of Egypt? I got you in the future. You you remember what I freed you from Pharaoh? I got this. You remember what happened there with the armies that were chasing you? Yeah, I got this. Do you remember when you were being pursued? Do you remember when you were hungry? Do you remember when you felt alone? Do you remember when you didn't have a direction to go and I led you in front and behind? Do you remember when I did all this in your past? I've got you tomorrow because I had you in the past. And don't forget, he's the God who never changes his mind and he can't lie. So I want to kind of do something that's a little crazy, but I think this will help. And I want to end with this. I think this will make a difference. And if it doesn't, you can sue me. So here we go. I'd like everyone to stand, please. I'd like you to put out your right hand. All right, those of you who used to be Baptists, don't freak out. We're not singing a song, all right? Just relax, all right? You got, you got your hand out, okay? Here you go. You got it? I, I used to be Baptist. All right, so. I want you to think first of something small, like uh, an item, like, 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 uh, uh, like Tic Tacs, that's great. Or I was thinking, that's nice. I was thinking M&M, preferably peanut M&Ms. I want you to think of something that you, Randy, I got a nod from that. First one of the day, thank you. I'd like, I'd like you to think of something small, whatever, so maybe you're a rock person, think of little stones. I just want you to think of those from there, all right? You got a pile of them there. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes with me. You can do this. We're not getting too weird, I promise. Come on, you can do it. You just pull your lids down. There you go, okay, all right. I want you to begin to remember and reflect on the ways and the times in the past where God has been good to you. I want you to think it through. Youngest to oldest in the room. Those of you in the booth. Those of you online. I want you to do this. And then for every time you can think of God blessing your life, answering a prayer, providing for your needs, I want you to put a little M&M or whatever you're in your right hand. I want you to picture loading it up with the times where you knew God was good to you, where God heard a prayer, where you were thankful for something. I want you to take a moment and just quietly reflect and see your hand filling up. I'm going to kind of quietly thank God out loud for this stuff, and that maybe will trigger some help for some of y'all. God, I thank you for the time you healed my son. Lord, I thank you for November 12th of 1982 when you rescued me. I thank you for forgiving my sins. Oh God, I thank you for redeeming my father when he had nothing but disinterest in you, pursuing him. Lord, I thank you for my wife. I thank you for always having a roof over our heads. Even now at the Fiddler's Place, we're so grateful. I thank you, Lord, that we've always had food to eat. Thank you for the friends in my life. Thank you for the time when I got really, really sick and you, you healed me. Thank you for this church. Thank you for my friends. 
Thank you that I have some money in my pocket. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you freely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, with your right hand still out, guys, look at me. I'd like you to do this. I'd like you to put your left hand out next to it. Your right hand, if it's like mine, is overflowing at this point. You've just begun. Imagine if you took really 15 minutes and just listed the ways God provided for your life, right? Okay. Your hand is overflowing with peanut M&Ms. All right, so there it is. It's overflowing. Your left hand is empty. Your left hand, though, will soon have something in it. And your left hand represents the storms that are sure to come. The storms, the disappointments, the challenges, the bad news, the things that Jesus said expect to come in this life. Can't avoid them. This is not our home. This is not where we're meant to be comfortable. It's going to happen. So you got some storms. You don't know what they are, but they're coming. Maybe one, maybe two, maybe five, ten, maybe this year. Maybe it's a year full of storms. And now when you look at your hand overflowing with the good things God has done, and when you look at the challenges that are coming your way, and you look at them both together, and you've kind of got your hands full with all the good and all the hard, all at the same time, I realize that the way you're going to have the strength to get through what's in the left hand that comes your way, says the scriptures, is not crossing your fingers and hoping it's not too bad and it's not too long. It's by choosing actively to place your hope in Christ. The Bible says he is faithful with what he's done. He'll be faithful to see you through tomorrow. So this is what gives you the faith to make this happen. See, because I don't know what you're going through, but I know someone who does. And here's what he says. If you'll put your faith in me, I will one day be able to walk with you and you'll see that you can take everything that was in this hand and it all ended up in this hand. Everything that was a challenge, you'll see my provision and my care and my safety and my answering. You'll see the work of God active in your life and that's how this whole thing becomes full of the hand of God. <laughs> Having said all that, I want to tell you the truth. The simple truth of it all is this. My hope for this series is that we will get traction on how to put our hope in Christ and what that looks like so that when the winds come and the rains blow and everything beats against our door, we walk with strength because we've got an anchor that holds us through the storm and he brings us to safe, calm shores on the other side. Dear friends, I don't know what you face, but I know someone who does and his name is the hope of all the world. The mere signal, the mere sound of his name signals hope for those whose hope is far, far away. Hope is not a feeling. Hope is a person, and his name is Jesus. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, Jesus, with our hands out before you. And we say, dear Heavenly Father, move in our lives. We thank you for what you've done in the past. We will not doubt you in the future. Right now, I pray for my friends in this room and those online and those from last service and those that are coming that we will begin to entertain this thought. What would it feel like to overflow with confident hope? To not have to live with constant fear of what's coming next. What's going to happen in my home, with my kids, with my job, with my money, with my health? I'm not okay. What if we had an indestructible hope because we anchor ourselves to the hope of the world? Thank you, Jesus, that in your name, hope is rising. May you receive the glory. We worship you, and we will not keep this to ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>